Our text for today is going to be Romans chapter 8, verses 35 to 39. The Apostle Paul writes, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing, shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. In the Gospel of John, chapter 10, Jesus says these words. He says, My sheep hear my voice, and they know me, and I know them, excuse me, and they follow me, and I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone pluck them out of my hand. My Father, who is greater than all, has given them to me, and no one can pluck them out of his hand. My Father and I are one. These passages, together with many other passages in Scripture, tell us that those to whom God gives eternal life shall never perish. The Father and the Son hold them in their hands, and they will never be lost. Now, as you may know, There are many who reject this concept, this doctrine, and usually their argument goes something like this. They know all the passages that that say that God will not lose us. God will not send us away. And they say, but what if we wander away? What if we fall away? God doesn't lose us, but what if we decide to leave, is the argument. There is a beautiful doxology at the end of the book of Jude. In Jude 1.24, which says this. As he's closing his letter, he says, Now to him, to God, who is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God be honor and glory forever he says to him who is able to keep you from falling now those who argue against this say okay well he's able to keep you but what What if the sheep in his hand pry themselves out of his hand? What if the sheep decide that they don't want to be in his hands anymore? What if the sheep decides to commit suicide? What if the sheep decides to jump on its own? The book of Jeremiah is a wonderful passage. There's a number of passages in Jeremiah and Ezekiel which speak of the new covenant that God is going to make with his people. And he compares it with the old covenant that God made with Israel. And he says, you know, in the old covenant, God made this covenant with Israel, and they did disobeyed, they were unfaithful, they would not stay with God. And so God is making a new covenant. And this new covenant is going to be different from the old one. And here's what he says in Jeremiah 32, 40. God says, I will make an everlasting covenant with them. Well, what's going to happen in that? That I will not turn away from them to do them good. And I will put the fear of me in their hearts so that they will not turn away from me. So in this new covenant, God does not leave us and we do not leave him. Because God keeps us. Now, some people call this doctrine the doctrine of once saved, always saved, which 
Though technically correct, I'm not a big fan of that phrase, and let me tell you why. To many people, when you say, once saved, always saved, it gives the impression that you can have a person who gets baptized, confesses his faith in Christ, whatever, goes to church, does something, and then leaves, goes off into the world, lives like the devil, and people say, well, what you going to do? Once saved, always saved. So, I know he's saved, so even though now he's completely living in gross sin, oh, it doesn't matter because once saved, always saved. But of course, the scripture teaches that those whom God saves, those whom God justifies, he also sanctifies, he changes them, and he conforms them to the image of Christ. In James chapter 2, James says, faith without works is dead. Uh, Anyone who claims to have faith, but then does not live for Christ, this is a dead faith. It is not a living, saving faith. Uh, In Hebrews chapter 12, the writer to the Hebrews says that without holiness, no, no one will see God. So scripture teaches that those whom God saves, he also sanctifies and cleans up. They don't, they're not going to go off living in sin. So even though the phrase, once saved, always saved, is technically correct, I think a lot of people might misunderstand it and get the impression that once you, well, you've made a statement of faith and then after that, doesn't matter, you're in, which is not how the Bible teaches it at all. I much prefer the, the term perseverance of the saints. Because what that teaches is that when a person is saved, when a person has been justified by God, he's not going to go then and live like the devil. He's not going to go then and just be like the rest of the world. But he perseveres to the end. He perseveres in the faith. Thus, perseverance of the saints. In fact, some people have said, well, we need to go further than that. Don't even call it perseverance of the saints. And we call it preservation of the saints. Because... Ultimately, it's God who keeps us. It's God who preserves us. I mean, all these terms are correct. They're all true. But the reason that we persevere in the faith is because God preserves us. Now, our text for today in Romans chapter 8 is on this very topic. The Apostle Paul in the entirety of chapter 8 has been giving us reasons why the Christian does not fall away and that God keeps him. He started off chapter 8 by saying there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. He talked about how God gives His Spirit to His people to change them, to give them life. He talked about how uh, God adopted us into His family and we are now God's children. He talked about in the last few verses how His plan from the beginning was to bring His people to glory. And over the past few weeks, we've been looking at the previous verses, you know, from verse 31 and after that, where he's been given a series of questions, rhetorical questions. He's been been saying things like this. If God is for us, who can be against us? If God justifies us, who can condemn us? And so now he brings his final question. In verse 35, he says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Now, what has been the answer to these questions? He hasn't explicitly given us the answer, but they're implied. When he said, If God is for us, who can be against us? What's the answer? Well, no one. If God you know, is the one who justifies, who can condemn us? Well, no one. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? No one. And what he's going to do now, he's going to give us a list in these next couple of verses. He's going to give us the list of examples of bad things that can happen and do happen to believers. Things that could be threats to our relationship with God. Okay? Things that could threaten our relationship with Christ. And the question is, can we be separated from him if these things happen? But what are they? They're all bad things, as I said. Verse 35, what does it say? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, 
or nakedness, or peril, or sword. And he quotes from Psalm 44, As it is written, For your sake we are killed all day long, we are counted as sheep for the slaughter. He names a bunch of terrible things here. He mentions famine, not having any food to eat, nakedness, not having any clothing to wear, and no shelter over you. He goes all the way to persecution, all the way to sword, all the way to death when he quotes Psalm 44. He's talking about being killed. Now, there are some people who say, oh, these things won't happen to believers. Who says that? Oh, there are plenty of people who say that. The people that I have mostly in mind, all those health and wealth preachers, who call it prosperity gospel, but it's not a gospel, it's a perversion of the gospel, where they basically said, well, if you're a Christian, everything's going to be awesome. You're a child of the king, so everything is going to be perfectly wonderful for you in your entire life. And, of course, anyone who's read the Bible says, oh, wait a minute. Well, yes, we are children of the king, actually, but do you remember what happened to our king, how he suffered and died? So, could we be on the same path as that also? These things that Paul here mentions are not theoretical. From the blood of righteous Abel that was spilt right in the beginning of the world all the way to today, the 21st century, believers have gone through a lot of terrible things. I want to read you a couple of passages. If you remember in uh, the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, we all remember the the great uh, uh, chapter on faith where Paul talks to... Paul, we'll see. The writer to the the Hebrews uh, gives a list of all these great saints of the past and their faith. And he talks about the great things that they did and how God so many times miraculously uh, rescued them. But then he says, but not everyone was rescued. And he says this, listen to this, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 36. It says, Still others had trial of mockings and scourgings, yes, and of chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, were tempted, were slain with a sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains and dens and caves of the earth. So in the Old Testament, he says, the people of God, it's not that everything was awesome for them. They went through a lot of difficulties. You say, well, what about in the New Testament? Well, all these things that Paul mentions here, he mentions nakedness and peril and famine and sword and persecution. Paul went through all these things. Paul had already been all all through these things when he wrote the book of Romans. Let me read you something. This is from 2 Corinthians chapter 11. And 2 Corinthians chapter 11 was written around the same time that he wrote Romans. He says this. 2 Corinthians 11 verse 24. Paul, speaking of himself, he says, From the Jews, five times I received the forty stripes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I have been in the deep. In journeys often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the Gentiles, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and toil, in sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. So Paul knows exactly what he's talking about when he says... What shall separate us? Shall famine or peril or sword or persecution or nakedness separate us from God? And let me take this a step further. I said this is not theoretical. Who's Paul writing to here? He's writing to the church in Rome. When did he write this? Early 50s. The first century. Early 50s. Do you know who became the emperor of Rome in the year 54? Nero. Do you know what Nero did to Christians in Rome? With having them being attacked by wild animals or being burnt alive and a number of other things. Those are the same people that Paul is writing to here. They're going to have to deal with these things. 
It's very easy for us sitting in an air-conditioned room, and these things seem very distant, but there's many places in the world where these things are still going on. So here's the question. If these things occur, these things have been happening in the lives of believers from the beginning of the world. If these things happen, if these things occur, what will happen to our relationship with Christ? That's the question. If we have to deal with these things, will they destroy our relationship to Christ? If our relationship is illegitimate, if our relationship, if, our, if we are Christians merely in name, then sure, they could cause all kinds of trouble. You remember the parable of the four soils? Sure you do. You have the sower who goes out sowing seed, and it falls on four different kinds of soils. He throws the first, and it goes on the, the pathway and just gets trampled up. Then he throws some more and it goes on the ground that's rocky. And so it starts growing, but it has no root, so, it's, so it dies out. And he throws more where there's a bunch of thorns and weeds and they choke it out. And then he throws it on the fourth and it grows and it produces 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold. Now, we know from that passage that the good soil is the believer. That's the believer who produces fruit, grows and produces fruit. We don't all produce the same amount of fruit, some 30-fold, some 60-fold, some 100-fold, but or all believers will produce some kind of fruit. But then we have these other soils, which are different aspects, different kinds of unbelievers. And the one on the rocky soil, Jesus explains to us, is the person who, he has no root, and as soon as difficulties or trials, or persecution arise, he immediately falls away. I'm not going to deal with this. My life could be much easier without Christ, without having to deal with all these problems. And so they immediately fall away. They're not willing to undergo any trials for Christ's sake. But the question is, what about true believers? What about the good soil that always will produce something? Can all these afflictions, all these problems, separate us from the love of God in Christ? The answer is in verse 37. He says, yet, in all these things, all these difficulties, all these trials that I just mentioned, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. This reminds me of verse 28 that we looked at a little while ago. In verse 28, Paul said that we know that all things work together for the good of those who love God, who have been called according to his purpose. And so again, here we have all these terrible things that can and do happen to believers. But he says, it all turns out for good. Not only do we survive through it, not only do, are we conquerors, but he says we are more than conquerors. God, how, but the question now is, how is it that we are more than conquerors? How is it that we make it, are, are we so strong? Are we so awesome? Are we so powerful that we can get through all these terrible things because we're like, well, he gives the answer. How is it that we're more than conquerors? Through him who loved us. This is the same thing that he said in Philippians chapter 4. Remember where Paul said, I can do all things. If you stop right there, you go, Whoa. well, good for you. <laughs> I can do all things. Are you Superman or something that you can do all things? And then he says, through Christ who strengthens me. So this is the same thing that he's saying here. God is the one. Christ is the one who keeps me. In the faith. God is the one who strengthens me. God is the one who loves me. And he is the one who helps me persevere and keeps me faithful. Let me give you one more verse. It's 1 Peter chapter 1. Right in the beginning of Peter's letter, he, uh, he's praising God and he's talking about what God has done for us. And he says, God has regenerated us. He's given us new life. And it is unto 
Here's what it says. An inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last day, in the last time. God has saved us and we are kept by his power through faith. So, after giving all these rhetorical questions, he has said, if God is for us, who can be against us? Uh, if God is the one who has justified us, who can condemn us? Who can separate us from the love of God? And he doesn't actually answer them. The implication is clear. The rhetorical questions. But in case you didn't get it, he's going to give us a direct statement in the last two verses. There's no questions here. He just states it. Verse 38 says this. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor thing present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. He starts off and says, I am persuaded. I am convinced. This is not, this is not wishful thinking. This is not, oh, I got a feeling. This is something that the Apostle Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit, is certain about. He has thought about it, and he is persuaded. He is convinced. Well, what are the things that cannot separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord? He says, neither life nor death. Neither death nor life. Those are the only two states of being that a human being can be in. Uh, you're either alive or you're dead. It's one of those two. And whatever happens in your, while you're alive, or whatever happens when you die, you will not be separated from Christ. There's nothing in your life, there's nothing in your death that will separate you from Christ. He says, no angels, nor principalities, nor powers. He's talking here about the spiritual world. He's talking about spiritual beings, angels, demons. If Satan could make you lose your salvation, he would do it. He would do it for every believer in the world. But he cannot. There's nothing in the spiritual world that is going to be able to separate us from Christ. He says, no things present, nor things to come. There's nothing that is happening in your life right now. And there is nothing that will happen in your life in the future that will separate you from Christ. I'm reminded of um, in the Gospel of uh, Matthew, chapter, chapter 24. Jesus is talking about bad days that are coming ahead in the future for his disciples. And he knows that things are going to be bad. And he says there's going to be false Christs and there's going to be false prophets who, will, who, who would deceive, if it were possible, even the elect. But I like that little phrase where he says, if it were possible, because it's not. Others, there are many who will be deceived, but not the elect. There's nothing that can happen in the future that will separate you from the love of Christ. And then he says, neither height nor depth. Now, he's just trying to find ways uh, to, to include every point of view now. All right, neither height nor depth. I mean... How high can we go? Can we go up to heaven? Can we go down to hell? And everything in between. There is nothing that can separate us from the love of Christ. And at this point, just in case... Because you know what happens. When, when you give a list of things, people will always try and find, what did you not mention? They're going to try and find some way, some argument against what Paul is saying here. And so, Paul knows that people are going to try and find something that he has missed. And so in order to just cover everything, he ends by saying, nor any other created thing. Nothing in all of creation. Does that, is that large enough? Look, there are, there are only two things 
only two modes of being, I don't even know how to say this. There are only two things that exist, there are only two things that, that are. There is the creator and the creation. Okay, there's nothing else. There's, there's nothing else. The creator, we have established, will not lose his people. He's not kicking them out. He is keeping them in his hand and will never lose them. So on the other side, what do we have? We have things that are created. And he says there is nothing that is created that can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. No other created thing. And the argument is always, back to what I said earlier, oh, but Nico, what if the person himself decides to abandon Christ? Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't know that the person himself was not a created thing. Listen. Look. If, if someone says that a Christian can lose their salvation and end up in hell. What is this passage even about? What have we been going through all these weeks, week after week? What is, what is Paul? I don't know what Paul is talking about here. Yet there are people who read this text. If God is for us, who can be against us? If God has justified us, who can condemn us? I am persuaded that nothing in all of creation can separate us from the love of God. And they read that and they say, Ah, oh, we could still be separated and go to hell. Okay. In the book of Jeremiah, chapter 31, the Lord speaks to His people and He says this. He says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. It does not end. If you are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, if you trust in Christ alone for your salvation, not trusting in yourself, not trusting in your own good works, not trusting in your religion, if you understand that you are a sinner and your only hope is Christ, the Bible says that those who trust in Him alone are justified. Your sins are placed on Him and you are forgiven. And His righteousness is applied to you, is accounted to you. And when God looks at you, He sees Christ. When God looks at you, He sees Christ, He sees His beloved Son, and God loves you. <laughs> Hear me out now. You're clothed in the righteousness of Christ. You're in Christ, united to Him. And God looks at you, and He loves you the same way that He loves His Son. It is an everlasting love. And God will not let His children be lost. He will not let your soul be lost ever. And that is the promise of Scripture. Let's pray.